We had been meeting at the California Academy of Sciences, but it was slated to begin building upgrades. And so um, we had to vacate having our lectures anymore at the Cal Academy, but we were welcomed back to the Randall Museum in January of 04, which was my very first time that I was a speaker chair. Uh, this was our original foundational meeting place beginning 70 years ago at the Josephine D. Randall Museum. We were having refreshments, meet and greet, lectures, telescope making, and, and scheduling star parties and things like that. Then during the Randall's building upgrades, we met at the Presidio for three and a half years. The newly renovated Randall Museum welcomed us back in June of 2018 and for our continued lectures in their auditorium. Um, tonight, Dr. Roger Blanford is the 209th person I've asked to speak to SFAA. I've loved serving as speaker chair and finding and introducing all of these wonderful speakers, which I've done for 19 years. I thought it was 18, but I counted and it was 19 years I've been doing this. But as you've heard, I'm now retiring after tonight. I also want to direct your thanks to JP who mentioned that he is no longer going to be joining us to help um, the live stream lectures anymore. He's enjoying Phoenix. So he'll be having some astronomy um, things to do while he's there. But thank you to Jay very, very much. Tonight, I'm so pleased to again introduce Roger Blanford for his third presentation to us. Roger Blanford took his BA, MA, and PhD degrees at Cambridge University. Following postdoctoral research at Cambridge, Princeton, and Berkeley, he took up a faculty position at Caltech in 1976, where he was appointed as the Richard Chase Tolman Professor of Theoretical Astrophysics in 1989. In 2003, he moved to Stanford University to become the first director of the Kavli Institute for Particle Astrophysics and Cosmology which is often referred to as CHIPAC, and also the Luke Blossom Chair in the School of Humanities and Science. His research interests include black hole astrophysics, cosmology, gravitational lensing, cosmic ray physics, and compact stars. He's a fellow of the Royal Society, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Physical Society, and a member of the National Academy of Sciences. In 2008 through 10, he chaired a two-year <laughs> National Academy of Sciences decadal survey of astronomy and astrophysics. Dr. Blanford was awarded the 1998 Danny Heinemann Prize of the American Astronomical Society. In, in 2013, the gold medal of the Royal Astronomical Society. In 2016, the Crayford Prize for Astronomy and the 2020 Shaw Prize for Astronomy. He also co-authored with Kip Thorne the textbook, Modern Classical Physics. And now we're about to learn a very exciting topic of the active social lives of big black holes. We welcome, we welcome you, Roger Blanford. Thank you so much. Perhaps I should uh, try to share first, shall I? I share screen, that one. While he's pulling up his uh, screen share, I was just going to say that um, you're welcome to uh, uh, type your questions into the chat window, or if you'd like to uh, speak up, you may. Um, we usually do uh, questions at the end, but uh, the lecturer said that he would welcome interruptions if if uh, if you if you feel so inclined. Um, so, but otherwise, um, there'll be uh, time at the end, and I'll be reading out of the Zoom, or you can you can speak directly. Uh, Back to the doctor, thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Linda and Jay, and allow me to add my congratulations for your extraordinary careers uh, leading um, uh, SFAA and uh, wish you well in your retirement and it will be a very two very hard acts to follow. So uh, all the best and thank you very much indeed. Uh, you asked me to talk about black holes and in particular uh, one particular piece of work I was a part of uh, on binary black holes. And 
what I decided to do was to talk a little bit more generally about the topic and then finish off with that particular uh, piece of work and, and, and tell you about it. So um, and it, it occurred to me that I should probably give it a theme and my theme will be, as you can read, the active social lives of massive black holes. And when I talk about massive black holes, I'm really going to emphasize the big black holes in the nuclei, mostly found in the nuclei of galaxies, uh, not the smaller ones the, about stellar mass and so on. And I believe it, you heard from Jeff, my colleague Jeffrey Liu and perhaps others more recently about the stellar black holes. And I will make the connection to those, but most of my emphasis will be on the big massive black holes. And uh, let me go on to the uh, next slide. Um, you will, of course, be aware that black holes have rather be become rather famous recently. Uh, there have been uh, two Nobel Prizes awarded for recently for discoveries about black holes, of course, be more in the past. Um, there are three perhaps iconic images are shown on this slide. And uh, the one on the left hand side, and I'll, I'll show you this is a movie, I hope, uh, is the um, a depiction of the merging black holes seen by the LIGO Gravitational Wave Observatory. The one in the, on the right hand side, which was the Nobel Prize, if you like, on the right hand side, was actually from Andrea Guess, who's in Southern California, tracing the orbits of stars around the black hole in our galaxy, to which I'll return in the center of that slide is um, uh, Reinhard Genzel. And on the left-hand side is, is Roger Penrose, who I will all, and I'll also mention. Uh, and then in the center is this sort of iconic image, um, which is the uh, black hole in, in M87. Um, and, uh, and I'll just, although I won't have time to say much about any, about these topics, there is much more going on and they're really counting my book at any rate as extraordinary discoveries. Uh, so, and I will say a little bit about some of this, but not much. Uh, gamma ray bursts, um, and I'm sure you've heard about those, then black holes are the, probably the most common um, idea for the source of the very highest energy cosmic rays that we observe on Earth. And these are amazing energies. They are atomic nuclei with energies of a well-hit baseball. You have to sit and think, take that in for a moment. So they have extraordinary uh, energies and yet their nature manages to accelerate into energies far, far greater than anything we could even contemplate on Earth. And we have to try and understand how. Um, for I think for the probably the majority of people who think about this, the big black holes are, are, are attributed as a source. And then in addition, and particularly recently, we're seeing gamma rays that it says here 300 TeV, but it's starting to look like, I won't claim this for sure, but it's really looking like they're going above a petroelectron volt. And I have to say it's a petroelectron volt is 10 to the 15 times, say, the energy of an infrared photon or something like that. It's um, a, a million times the energy of a regular proton. And so again, these are photons with these extraordinary unprecedented energies, which nature seems able to produce. A great, a great mystery. And then finally, uh, again, I will not say about this, except that again, um, Black big black holes are, are are associated with them. Uh, they are the even more energetic neutrinos that are seen. These are the ghostly, weakly interacting particles, and they're being seen. And the claims, and there was a big fuss about this a couple of weeks ago from a nearby a nearby active galaxy of these neutrinos with energies again uh, six a million times more energetic than a proton. So. There's a lot going on and black holes are blamed for much of it. Now, um, having said that, of course, there's been much uh, skepticism, uh, but uh, here's, here's a, um, a joke on the right-hand side about uh, the, the uh, 
all of the newspaper hype, if you like, about the black hole in, in the image in M87, one of my colleagues said it was all a government hoax. This is really what you are looking at. I was very amused by this. Um, but um, but leave that as it may, black holes, of course, have entered popular culture, a source of um, uh, of many bad jokes. Uh, the one on the left hand side, it says uh, it's full of unmatched socks. Um, I won't, the ones on the right hand side are even worse. Um, it's been a source of some dubious science fiction. Um, and you can see a, just a, a small sample here, um, a, a rather more classy version of this, although not called a black hole, is uh, uh, Dante's al Allegory of Hell and shown in Botticelli's image here. You can make that association if you choose. Um, entered the vernacular. Um, and uh, you can see there the black hole there. And uh, movies, of course, had much to do with this. And here are some particularly bad movies about black holes. Here's uh, one that's much more thoughtful and introduces the idea of a wormhole, which is a wonderful construct and uh, screenwriters who uh, create scripts that turn, turn their whole uh, uh, screenplay into, a, into a, a, a corner, can escape from them using a wormhole to take them to another part of space time. So again, um, uh, black holes have been very good for the entertainment business. And uh, Linda kindly mentioned my friend and colleague, Kip Thorne. And OK, so, uh, I'm, I'm telling you that I don't believe the wormholes are going to uh, be any good except for uh, at the um, at the uh, quantum level, not not at the sort of classical level. They're not really going to take movie stars from one place to another. Um, and then there's my friend and colleague, as I said, Kip Thorne, who was the um, uh, originator and uh, indeed heavily involved with the movie Interstellar, uh, which uh, was uh, a rattling good yarn and uh, exemplified many of the features uh, of uh, black holes, which we believe as general relativists, what they would look like, for example, here. Here's a, a father-daughter relationship down here. Go figure that one out. Um, and lots of equations over here and a, a tale of daring do as well on, but also I think a, a sort of teaching, a, 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 a teaching vehicle. And uh, I certainly enjoyed it and I hope you did too. And, and um, uh, Linda mentioned that I wrote a, bit, a, a book with Kip and uh, he very generously donated me the, um, this is a textbook, of course, for graduate students, and he gave gradually, he do donated me the movie rights for this, but I'm still looking for a director. Anyway, so let's say a little bit more seriously about black holes, and I'm just going to go through this rather quickly, because I think most of this is probably familiar, but I thought I'd better just give this introduction but because there may be some people for whom it is a little bit new. And so let me just go through it rather quickly. Firstly, if we start off with Isaac Newton, here's a, uh, a picture of, of Woolsthorpe, which is the place where he was born. And there's a sort of later depiction of, uh, later painting of Isaac Newton and the famous apple, which almost certainly was not the cause of, the th of his ideas about gravity. I like this image for two reasons. One is I was born four miles away from Woolsthorpe and I always boast about this to my students and they are totally unimpressed. So I, um, nonetheless, the other thing is you can tell that this is where Newton must have dreamt up calculus because you can see these integrals carved into the walls um, here. And um, that of course is an extreme, for those who know the history of mathematics, that is an extremely cruel joke because the integral sign was the invention of uh, Newton's uh, bitter rival Leibniz. And so, but nonetheless, here they are on the, on the wall in, in Woolsthorpe Manor in, uh, in Lincolnshire. And of course, uh, one of the things that really did, Newton did really think about was uh, gravity on the surface of the earth is epitomized by this apple, but also uh, what the moon, the same sort of gravity was attracting the moon and keeping it orbit around the earth. And on, from that, he got his famous inverse square or a much else besides. And Newtonian physics, of course, uh, is, a, is a special, is the basis of so much of 
modern science and technology and engineering. And it wasn't really till the 20th century that quantum mechanical principles and, and relativity uh, became uh, important in pushing physics forward in many new directions. And so for a lot of engineering today, still it's basically Newtonian in its inception. And even for that, those parts that are heavily involved in quantum mechanics and relativity, Newtonian physics is is um, is uh, front is front and center is is the base. Sorry, the foundation for this, I should say. And so um, going through through leaping over all of that history, Albert Einstein, as is well known, built on these Newtonian ideas to produce essentially a classical theory of gravitation that combined itself with special relativity and dealt with situations where the speed of light was uh, very important for you. And just summarizing something that is much more complicated, he said that space and time should be combined together, not into um, a three-dimensional thing and a one-dimensional thing, if you like, but a four-dimensional thing called space-time. And then he said that the curvature, this space-time is not flat like a piece of paper. It really is genuinely curved. And that curvature um, uh, causes matter to not go uh, to not go in the way you might have once have thought, and in particular, it directs the moon to orbit the Earth. For what to give but one example, and in in fact, the moon is following what is effectively a straight line in the curved space time around the Earth. And then the third part of this uh, story, this great leap forward in physics is that that curvature is created by the amount of stuff there is around, the matter that's there, and that curvature is um, described by uh, Einstein's famous equation here, which I won't tell you what G and T are, but it basically says that the curvature is determined by the matter. And so if you've got a certain amount of curvature present, then that's telling you that there's matter there. And so that in a very superficial way, is the content of the general theory of relativity, and that is the basis of our description of black holes. So let's go with the history of black holes. Uh, there were several people who wondered about what would happen if we had mass that was so dense that it, uh, light did not have the escape velocity from its surface, just like a rocket that isn't going to escape the Earth's gravitational pull, unlike the Artemis rocket, which does have the escape velocity, but the uh, uh, less powerful ones don't, what would happen if that were true for something mo moving with the speed of light? And John Mitchell is famous for thinking about this in, a, in a, an important way. And then in the context, that was, of course, in the context of Newtonian physics, but in the context of relativity, uh, Carl Schwarzschild actually solved Einstein's equations and demonstrated the existence of what today we would call a black hole. And so I like to think of that this is saying that in a theoretical way, black holes can exist in general relativity. And then here are two more giants of physics. Uh, uh, one is Subramanian Chandrasekhar, the other is Robert Oppenheimer, who in different ways said that black holes really ought to exist. Firstly, Chandrasekhar showed that there was really a maximum mass that a white dwarf star, which you know all about, that a white dwarf star can have. And then Chandras and then Robert Oppenheimer said there was a maximum mass that a neutron star could have. And uh, those were, again, uh, important limits. And those limits uh, implied that if you kept on pouring mass onto these two types of star, then you would um, be left with essentially no little alternative but to form a black hole of the sort that had been originally described by Carl Schwarzschild. And so this realization uh, brought about a revolution in the 1960s that was really driven by uh, theoretical physicists and applied mathematicians who took seriously Einstein's equations and in, in the case of Roy Kerr, demonstrated a solution, a truly remarkable discovery. He found a solution to Einstein's equations that uh, describe a spinning black hole. And to all intents and purposes, 
that solution, at least in the context of astrophysics, uh, that solution is all we need. That describes effectively all of the black holes uh, that we describe, we see with our many different types of telescope. Now, uh, there are other types of black holes that exist, and um, there's no limit to the free febrile imaginings of uh, theoretical physicists and so on. And they can introduce these black holes, and maybe one day they'll, they'll be seen. But nothing we've observed with our telescopes needs any more than the black holes that were first described by Roy Kerr. Um, on the bottom left-hand corner is a picture of John Wheeler, who founded a school, if you like, to which Kip Thorne actually believed, belonged, um, for uh, studying matters relativistic. And he is also credited with coining the phrase black hole, although in, it, it was actually used by an Australian journalist called Anne Ewing beforehand. But I think uh, Wheeler's coinage was independent of hers. I, I believe that to be the case. On the right hand side is Roger Penrose, who is, of course, is uh, as famous as a popularizer of science and of bold ideas as he is as a contributor to mathematical physics at many forms, in particular in general relativity. And he was the first person to realize that um, these spinning black holes, there was an energy associated with the rotation, and not only could it just be associated with it, it could also be extracted. In, a, in an astrophysical way. And so, so black holes are not just uh, sources of gravity and you can drop thing, drop rubbish into it and get energy out, just like if you drop something on the floor, it will get a little bit, little bit hotter. Um, you can also extract the spin energy of the black hole. And the modern way we think about this is not to do it in the way that Roger described it, but instead to use magnetic fields, and they turn out to be very efficient agents for tapping the spin energy of the black hole. And I'll come back to that point. It's important for what I have to say. And then finally, in the bottom right-hand corner is Stephen Hawking, who um, uh, was, along with Roger, made uh, great discoveries in the math, in the sort of classical theory of black holes, and also effectively jump-started the quantum mechanical theory of black holes by showing that tiny, tiny black holes, not the big ones that astronomers see, but tiny, tiny ones, can radiate and behave just like quant fascinating quantum mechanical objects. And there's, that's been a, an extraordinary fertile area in theoretical physics, which he eventually founded in 1974. And I, I again, I have a sort of a slight personal connection to this in that at that time, I think I had the office next to him when he was doing this exciting work, and it was it was it was really a very exciting time just to watch all these things being being discovered. So let me move on. Um, now uh, I'm now turning into uh, turning to the social aspects of of my topic, and I'm going to tell you that black holes are always hungry. Uh, and that's one of the eating is one of the most social things you can do. And they do that, not in a very polite way, perhaps, but they certainly eat. And when they eat, they are quite capable. It isn't required to do this, but they're quite capable of turning mass into energy with extraordinary efficiency. And if we think about um, the efficiency of chemical reactions, we're perhaps a billion times per unit mass more efficient using gravitational energy around a black hole. If we go to something that's got much more bang for your buck, uh, a nuclear reactor, for example, nuclear, we're talking about at least 100, maybe several, probably more like several hundred times the efficiency of nuclear power is the gravitational energy of a black hole. So uh, unsurprisingly, I and I'm sure many others get uh, er earnest uh, explanations of how to solve the world's energy needs, first catch your black hole, and then you can also get get rid of all your unused rubbish and throw it into it and um, and extract power from it. Of course, you first got to catch your black hole. But the extraordinary efficiency is the key to understanding why tiny black holes on the other side of the universe are so bright and so easily seen with our telescopes. So um, historically, the sort of first expression of this was probably at the stellar scale. And here's a cartoon of a binary star where the one of the stars is a black hole and the other is a regular star that is transferring mass from its surface, usually by just 
um, tipping over and, and orbiting the black hole in a disk, but in some cases it can do it through a wind, a stellar wind, just like the solar wind, and that can be a supply of gas to the black hole. And because these black holes are so efficient, you don't have to supply very much mass for unit time. It, it can be done rather parsimoniously, but you get so much light and x-rays and so on out of it that you can see them, as I say, across the universe if they're big ones, and you can see them across the galaxy if they're small ones, despite this small supply of mass. And so um, in the 1970s, it became very clear that these weren't just figments of, the of theoreticians' imaginations. Uh, they really were uh, denizens of, uh, of the natural world out, in, out there in the universe. And we now know they're extremely common. When you supply them, not parsimoniously, with as much mass as they can take, then you get, at the massive scale, then you get the uh, quasars, which were discovered in 1963 by uh, my colleague, who sadly just passed away, Martin Schmidt, in, um, and they could be brighter than a, a, tri uh, a trillion suns, so that means they can outshine the galaxy by factors hundreds or thousands. And when this happens, we call these the quasars. And uh, when we the supply of gas and the, and the corresponding luminosity of these objects is much less, then we will we'll, they'll be more likely active galactic nuclei, and they have very many different names, like C for galaxies and so on. I'm not going to go through all that taxonomy, but um, the big and the biggest and the brightest, this one is 3C273, the first one that Martin Schmidt discovered. Um, and that, as I say, can be, they can be as bright as a, th a thousand galaxies. So they completely outshine the galaxies. That's why they're called quasi stellar. They look like stars in an optical image. So there's, uh, there's uh, a, a, a well supplied black hole. Um, here's one that's. Um, really starved it's on a starvation diet it, you'd uh, you really would want to feel a little bit sorry for it it's the one at the center of our galaxy which has a mass unlike the up to 10 billion solar masses of the bright biggest and uh, biggest black holes we know about this one is a mere four million solar masses and starved of food it really is um uh, and um, uh, but that, of course, enabled it to be examined in great detail by Andrea Gez and Reinhard Genzel and their teams, chasing the orbits around the this galaxy. And just like following the planets around the sun, you can follow the orbits of stars. Now about thirty stars, you can follow them around our black hole, and that's why we know so accurately what the mass is. But we can also do lots of other things like um, test general relativity and so on using these orbits. And so um, I, I said you might want to feel sorry for the black hole in our, our galaxy being starved in this way, but you should not feel ashamed of it. I trust me, you wouldn't want to live next to a quasar. So be very grateful that we're living uh, close to a starved black hole. You wouldn't want one that was being fed as much as it could be. So there's uh, the um, uh, our Milky Way galaxy and, and the black hole in that one. Let me say a little bit more about what I refer to in the context of Roger Penrose about black hole power. There are really two conduits for supplying um, energy from a black hole. Sometimes I call these, uh, with a nod to evolutionary biology, nature and nurture. The nurture part is when we give it gas, and we give it lots and lots of gas, and that gas, as it gets closer and closer to the black hole, is going to give up gravitational energy. And that giving up of gravitational energy enables it to radiate and to shine in the dark for the gratification of astronomers and so on. And the way it usually does this is through an accretion disk. And if we were to look at that accretion disk as we have been in the iconic image of M87, and if we were to look at a sort of very 
a complete accretion disk in a, in a rather structured way, which is more resolution than we have at the moment, then it would look rather like that image in, on the left-hand side. And that is what we're really observing in that, and that's just a, a, a depiction, if you like, that depiction is just the release of gravitational energy. That is the nurturing of a black hole. But then there's also the nature of the black hole, and typically they spin. And as far as we can tell, because we can actually measure this, they seem to, many of them seem to be spinning nearly as fast as they are allowed to do. And what that means is that if a black hole is spinning, it has this famous event horizon, this surface beyond which sort of macroscopic objects cannot return. It's a sort of point of no return. Um, but outside that is a region known as the ergosphere. And that ergosphere, um, if you were there doing experiments in that ergosphere, you went there in a spaceship or something like that, then you would have to rotate. The space-time is being dragged around by the spinning black hole. And within that gray region depicted on the right-hand side here, you would have to be rotating in the same sense as the black hole. And so, uh, and that really is the basis of having some spin energy that you can extract from the black hole. And what you end up doing it's a, it's a sort of kind of cute thing to do. It's a little bit of cute physics, if you like, is through some, me some mechanism, either through mechanics or more plausibly, through, as I said, through electromagnetic field, within this ergosphere, you can give some totally negative energy to the black hole. So you give totally negative energy to the black hole. Energy is conserved. And so that means you've got positive energy out of the black hole and you've reduced the mass of the black hole by giving it negative energy. So that's basically the way it works. And this uh, nature side of the, of the possibility, the second mode of taking, spin, taking energy out of the black hole by taking it out of its rotation rather than its gravitational energy, this, um, this second way is, we believe, made manifest in, um, in, in my next topic, which are the relativistic jets. So let's say that, as I know that you have seen in earlier talks, black holes famously, not all the time, but many times make relativistic jets. And I, this is a rather busy slide with more details on it, but I think it's, it's probably um, uh, quite relevant here. And I'm going to return to this iconic image of M87 seen in, as image F, if you like, on the bottom right-hand corner of this tableau. And M87 was the galaxy that was first noticed by Curtis at the Lick Observatory in, um, in 1917. And uh, he's up there, he's up here. He's Whoops, sorry, he's up here. Um, there's Heber Curtis. And um, he observed what he called a curious straight ray coming out of this galaxy M87, about 50 million light years away. And this we now know as a relativistic jet. And we can see it on many scales. On the very largest scale here, this is observed. So it's about way out, it's out, see it outside the galaxy. And then as we go into smaller and smaller scales, we see a jet here. It's on both sides, but we just see it on one side. And then if we look on the very smallest scale, we see this a ring around the black hole, the black hole shadow, if you like, which the Event Horizon Telescope uh, people famously saw about five, four or five years ago. And so this has been a, a wonderful piece of development and observational astronomy. And it's been throughout the electromagnetic spectrum. Here's the cluster of galaxies surrounding this. We see it here in X-rays. Here's the, uh, another X-ray image of the jet. It's seen in not just in radio waves, optical and X-rays and gamma rays as well. So we see it in all wavelengths and possibly even in neutrinos. Um, the black hole can be well measured. Um, here's my uh, colleague, Mungo Wal Sargent, and he and uh, his team were able to measure uh, the mass of the black hole. And they found it to be 
5 billion solar masses. And now after all this time and a lot of effort, it's now known to be six. So they did a remarkably prescient piece of work. And as I say, these black holes make the jets and the jets are relativistic features that move away from the black holes on both sides, these collimated uh, outflows of energy, if you like, of power on both sides. We now know, as you can see from these images down here, an awful lot of the, about them. And in the case of M87, we actually know what the angle between the axis of the jet, say here, or whoops, sorry, back again, or here, we know what that angle is. It's about 17 degrees. Um, a, a, a source like the black hole in M87, if it were pointed towards us with an angle of, say, less than a degree or so, then it would be very bright because when we have a relativistic uh, outflow coming towards us, then that will be extremely bright. And those are objects, they have a name, they are called blazars, um, after BL lack objects and the sort of nod to quasars, they're called blazars. And I'll have a little bit more to say about those too. So these relativistic jets, when they're pointing towards us, are extremely bright. And so uh, they are, in fact, 98% of the gamma ray sources that are seen on, on, on the sky are these blazars. And they just, they pick themselves out. It's not paranoia. They pick themselves out, the ones that are pointing towards us, because they are, that's just a relativistic effect that makes them very bright. So here, here are the relativistic jets. And there are many more here. There's, uh, here's an image from a South African telescope telling us there's a billion of these on the sky. Here's the Crab Nebula. That makes relativistic jets too. Here's, um, uh, I'll come to the source in a moment. Here's one that allegedly makes neutrinos. It's a blazar that makes neutrinos. Here's one of the gravitational wave events that makes relativistic jets. Here's even a protostar that makes not relativistic jets, but makes jets. They're very common with these jets too. So jets are all over the place. Here's one from three C, uh, from Pers from a, um, a galaxy in the Perseus cluster, three C eighty four, and here's one from a nearby galaxy, Centaurus A, which has many of the features of the one I've just shown you from M eighty seven. It's got this edge bright and source there. So let's move on. Uh, I. I thought to remove, okay, this is just a, another nice set of images of that Centaurus A galaxy. It's a very close by galaxy. We can study in a lot of detail and we can study its jet. I won't say any more about that. Here are some more of these jets. You can see all these features. You can swish them around in many different ways. And this is, uh, these are our famous jets. And again, that'll, that'll come up in my story in a moment. So I want to say in this case here, we've got a jet which we think it's two galaxies in a binary orbit, and that jet is being swished or is being swung around, just like water, watering the garden and moving your hand around. Uh, this is what the feature that we make there, sorry. And uh, here is a jet that we think is processing uh, in, the, in the nucleus of that galaxy. And again, it makes this strange sky writing, this shape on, on the sky. Uh, here's the most powerful radio source we know close by. It's called Cygnus A. It's a very famous one that has jets. And here are another pair of black hole, another pair of galaxies with orbiting jets. And so, um, and then these, uh, as I say, they're very interactive, very socially interactive. This may look like a, a hangover from Halloween, but it isn't. It's an X-ray image of the Perseus cluster of galaxies seen, as I say, seen in the x-rays. There's a black hole in the center there. That's that 3C84 I just showed you. And that inflates with these jets to giant bubbles here. And these bubbles float upwards. You can see an older one there, another older one there. These float upwards and they heat the gas around it. And so the gas around the black hole around the galaxy in, 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 in the Perseus cluster is heated by this tiny black hole, no, no larger than the solar system, makes these jets which heat all the gas outside the black hole. So it has a huge environmental impact and in practice limits the growth of galaxies 
and also spawns the growth of other galaxies in nearby potential wells. So it has a, a major interactive uh, impact on its surroundings, a huge environmental impact, if you like. And so that's what these black holes do. They aren't just sitting there like some uh, 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 terrifying uh, monster in a Greek tale waiting to devour its next, super next superhero. Uh, these are actually regulating a lot of the development of galaxies in, in our universe. So I said that black holes eat gas. They also eat stars. This has been expected that they would eat stars. And for uh, in the 60s, it was thought for a while that their major diet comprised stars, not gas. But then it became clear that most of their diet is, is gas. But still, there are stars there. And these stars, Icarus-like, if you allow me to follow the Greek metaphor again, um, get occasionally uh, get foolhardy and get too close to the black hole. And then they get ripped apart by the, the tidal forces, similar to those that provide tides on the Earth, but much, much larger, and they get ripped apart. And so what happens is that um, stars, uh, a, ga a star around here, unsuspecting, as I say, it gets very close to a black hole, and then it gets ripped apart. Some of the gas will be bound to the black hole and over the next months to years, it will fall slowly into the black hole and uh, provide the fuel for making that uh, galactic nucleus, that black hole, much brighter than it typically is. And the rest of the gas will escape uh, uh, from the clutches of the black hole in an, on unbound orbits. I've got here, I'm not sure this is going to work, but I'll try it. It's been... This is a uh, there's there's one of those iconic images, and this is just a, a quick movie, and I, I I hope it'll give some flavor of how the star is ripped apart as it um it's, it's obviously just a depiction as it gets here's the star coming in unsuspecting uh, close to the black hole, and you can see it in a different place here, and it's um it's pulled apart by tidal forces. And then showing again what happens next, then you make all this gas, some of which falls back in to make an accretion disk and to make jets. It can make jets, not always, but often. And some of the gas, as you can see, is escaping. And these are called tidal disruption events. And they've been now been discovered and uh, observed. We know hundreds of them and they're, um, and they're very good. And uh, one of the things that they do is you can make a very simple minded prediction of how fast the light from these tidal disruption events should decay a bit like a supernova. And uh, here, the, here's, here's the theory and here's the observations. Not all of them are this good, but some of them are. And so we've good reason to believe that we're looking at stars being ripped apart by uh, by black holes in the nuclei of galaxy when we see these big outbursts. Another big question, and this is really is a big question in the massive black hole business, is that uh, is to ask how are uh, black holes born? Um, and the, 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 there's an awful lot that's been written about this, an awful lot of thinking, an awful lot of simulations and so on. But I think my own view is it's still very much up in the air for the massive black holes. But for the stellar black holes, we do have some ideas. And basically, there are things called gamma ray bursts, and uh, which can, here, here's one here. Uh, let me just move forward. I'm going to move forward from this, actually, because I'm going to run out of, um, I'm going to start going to run out of time. But basically, these gamma ray bursts, the majority of them represent the, um, well, I can go back here. They represent uh, the birth cries of black holes either as a form of, as a one type of supernova where you make a black hole as a result of the collapse of a massive star or one type of event where you get a binary neutron star and gravitational radiation causes them to spiral together and make a black hole so both of those are the are the births if you like of 
uh, of stellar black holes, of small mass black holes, and something analogous, not quite the same, but somewhat analogous, may happen to the massive black holes, but we really have much less understanding right now. And I'm hoping that Webb Web will, Web Space, uh, James Webb Space Telescope will tell us more about this. Now, finally, I'd, I'd like to uh, end up where I advertise, which is this business of binary black holes. As you all know, binary stars often do find partners. Uh, they uh, are commonly in binaries and often in triples too. And uh, the, uh, the expectation was um, that they, this would be the same, would be the same thing for the massive black holes in the nuclei of galaxies. And I wrote a paper, I co wrote a paper in 1980, I think it was, where we sort of confidently predicted that we would see lots of these binary black holes because galaxies are made up out of mergers of black holes, all, black ho all galaxies have black holes in their center, and they should, in the course of time, spiral together and make binaries which will eventually decay through the through gravitational radiation. And what has happened is they've, it's really been very hard to find them. They have been very elusive. They are very shy. And something must be going on that we don't understand that is preventing us from either finding them or from stopping them from forming. So that's one of the big puzzles. But we do have one or two cases where we think we may have seen them. It's just they're much rarer than we imagined. Oh, this is just a LIGO simulation. I, I, um, I'll just show a little bit of it. But... Um, this is what happened when two black holes get very close together and gravitational radiation causes them to spiral inwards. I'm sure you've seen this before. And this is what the ba a background star field would look like seen through this curved space time. And they're going to merge very shortly and leave you a single black hole in the middle and lots of gravitational radiation, which has been detected in about 100 cases by uh, LIGO and other telescopes. So. Uh, and so in the case, I think I showed you 3C75 and NGC 7727 is, is somewhat similar. NGC 3C75 is really two galaxies that are sufficiently separate. They're, they're in a binary orbit and they both make jets that orbit each other. In the case of NGC 7727, we have two nuclei in the galaxies, which is probably the result of a merger. And then there was a piece of work that I was involved with. Oh, um, sorry, let me, I'm, let, I'll skip on this. I'll just go straight to this case. Um, then there was a piece of work which I was involved in, which I think um, was you to, to make this this, um, uh, this invitation. And uh, this was a discovery that was really made by my colleagues, um, uh, sort of senior professor and one of my oldest friends, Tony Reedhead here, led this work. But the actual work, and I think the discovery he's done, was actually a Caltech undergraduate and uh, Sandra O'Neill, shown here on the left-hand side. And what, what, what was found was that one particular act... Whoops. Um, I'm trying to get to one to stop that. Stop that. I'll stop that there. Okay, um, I've got to seem to have a hyperactive mouse. Um, what was found was a periodic but interrupted signal of the uh, of the radio emission from uh, a particular active galaxy with a black hole in it, and it was periodic with a, a period of two years, and the same period was seen over a 45 year interval. And it's very hard to do that with the sort of gas dynamical explanation. So the by far the most reasonable explanation was that uh, it was a binary black hole that you were looking at uh, with um, uh, a separation of the two black holes about the same size as the solar system. And, uh, and then this is where I, I got a little bit involved in this was showing that it could actually uh, be um, explained the, the modulation that was seen if, if one of these black holes had a, a jet associated with it and that jet as it was being flung around you'll see it in this you'll see it in this um, uh, movie here without the um, I hope without the uh, uh, so there's a jet there without without the music 
And so this is, if you like, just one jet. So from a black hole, and they're very short, you'll see what happens if you swing them around uh, in a binary orbit, then you'll see that sort of modulation with the orbital period that's shown in the, in the data above. And it's, uh, the same data is shown here in, in this uh, PR um, movie that was made. And uh, so 45 years of radio observations, you know, heroic business taking these observations, and you can see there the black hole in orbit, and the jet moves around, and it's sort of getting a bit more closer to being a blazer than a bit less like a blazer, and that modulates the emission that you see, and that this sort of dance, this sort of cosmic dance, if you like, um, is um, uh, responsible for the modulation of the emission. And I, I don't think any of us are 100% persuaded that this has to be a binary black hole, but we're getting pretty, pretty close. Uh, but it, it's a pretty strong case and we'll see, see more. Uh, we'll certainly see more sources like this and that'll be very interesting. So let me just finish at this point, um, I think, uh, just with, uh, if you like, three mottos. Um, I hope I persuaded you that far from being uh, dead and dormant, black holes are very much alive. They thrive by eating. And because they can only grow with time, I have to say that they will survive. So thank you very much indeed. I'd be very happy to entertain questions. All right, wonderful. Thank you for that. Uh, we do have a question ready to go here in the chat. And uh, if anybody else has questions, please type them into the chat or, or raise your hand or just speak up. Uh, this question comes from Yevgeny. Um, within the ergosphere, is there a limit to how far space-time can be stretched as it is dragged over time? Um, okay, I'm, I'm going to give an answer that's, uh, I'm not quite sure if it's addressing your question, but the point is that thanks to Roy Kerr and those who translated his his solution into a slightly more accessible image so it's, it's language sorry slightly more accessible language we have a, a really good understanding of what the space time is like outside the black hole event horizon and within the ergosphere we can describe it rather carefully and rather mathematically it's not controversial and uh, it is what it is and and the more spin you have in the black hole the more it gets stretched now things get to a limit when the spin of the black hole reaches a maximum value and if the black hole were to go beyond that maximal value uh you would have a na what's called a naked singularity um and you'd see uh through the event horizon to all sorts of um uh, wicked stuff going on but nature turns out to be rather prurient um uh there are curtains there and the curtains protect our uh our, our sensibilities from having to see a uh, uh a naked singularity inside a black hole and this is known as the uh, roger penrose gave it this name the principle of cosmic censorship and so we um and you might say, well, why, why can't I just throw more and more rocks into a black hole and spin it up so I get a, a, a naked singularity and take, take you to your limit? And the answer is, however many rocks we throw in, we, we never get to that limit. It's just, a, it's just an unattainable limit. And so that's really cosmic censorship. So, so I think the answer is, in all practical purposes, as far as we can tell, uh, the answer is yes, and there is, there is a, a limit, and it's well described by mathematics. However, if you were to uh, send me in, uh, by Amazon a, uh, a, a, a black hole spinning faster than that with a naked singularity inside it, then it would have amazing properties, and you would see every limit you wanted to see. Not very good. <clears throat> Uh, we have a raised hand from uh, Kevin. I, yeah, can you hear me okay? I hear you. I Go ahead. Great. Thanks so much. This is absolutely wonderful. Forgive a question that may be a little far afield, 
But what's the lower size? Well, actually, two questions. One is, what's the lower size limit for black hole? Are they all going to be a couple of stellar masses or more? Or might there be tiny ones left over from, I don't know, very early in the universe or something? Second question is, if it has been hard to find these binary black holes at the centers of galaxies, is there any thinking as to why that might be hard to find? I mean, aside from they just might not be there. I don't even know what. I'm just interested in the speculation. Thank you. Um, there was something wrong with your description of those two questions. They were not far afield. They were front and center. They were they were both excellent questions, and I thank you for them. They were things that I wanted to say and didn't have time to say. So thank you. Um, the masses of black holes. Okay, I'm going to wear my astronomy hat. Uh, astrophysics hat, things we know and observe like stars and galaxies and nebulae and so on. And the smallest black hole that we can reasonably make is, I think, in one of those neutron star binaries. So we've got a couple of neutron stars that are going to spiral together. They're going to leave you behind a compact object that's more massive than the um, uh, maximum mass of a, of a neutron star, as we calculate nowadays, which is round about two and a half times the mass of the sun. And provided the sum of the two um, uh, initial neutron star masses is more than that, minus some, some extra some corrections, but they're like 10% corrections, provided it's lower than that, then uh, that will make you a black hole. That's what will have happened in the, in, the, in the famous neutron star binary that LIGO saw. And so that ought to be somewhere like about 2.8 so times the mass of the sun. And that is, you know, for a, for a sort of reasonable conservative astronomer, that is what you would expect to see. Now, if you allow me to wear my speculative theoretical physics come cosmologist hat, I might say, as Stephen Hawking did, that maybe there's a whole uh, sea of primordial black holes out there and by all sorts of witchcraft in the early universe, we can create them with masses, say, of 10 to the 15 grams, the mass of a big mountain or something like that. And in that, that's the sort of mass you need for them to radiate by Hawking radiation and to be. Uh, uh, and uh, we have no evidence whatsoever that those exist. And if we try and think about it a little bit more seriously than I was just then, it turns out to be rather hard to make them, but nature is in often cleverer than we are. And so it's perfectly reasonable to think about them. Where they do exist in abundance is in the, as I say, the febrile imaginings of theoretical physics. And uh, there, the theoretical physicists have, take, have used them as a means of thinking very deeply about how quantum gravity works, and about very fundamental issues of quantum mechanics as are brought out by the behavior of the event horizons of very tiny black holes. So they are alive and well in the minds of theoretical physicists. I'd love to see one. I even once spent some time trying to find them observationally, and um, it never, ne ne nothing ever came of that. But it's um, interesting uh, uh, to, do, uh, to, uh, to speculate that they might one day be found. And, you know, people are certainly on the lookout for them. So I would say the conservative answer is 2.8, 2.6 or 7.8 solar masses. Now, the second question is, is to me even more interesting. Why are there not so many uh, black holes found? And one, one explanation, which has a very, um, uh, so I went again to trouble saying this, um, um, uh, in, um, if you get two black holes, they'll happily orbit one another, slowly losing energy through gravitational radiation until they merge, giving you one black hole. But if you have three, then you form a, a menage a trois, and that is a rather unstable situation. Um, it only in the black hole case, of course, but that's a rather unstable situation. And what can happen very easily is that two of them can go off in one direction and the other can go off conserving momentum in the other direction and they can be lost from the, from the center of the, of the galaxy. 
And so that's one way of removing black holes from the center of the galaxy. Another way of doing it is if you have just two black holes and they merge in a rather special way, not only can they radiate what's called angular momentum, they can actually, if they're unequal, they can radiate linear momentum. And that can give them enough recoil to disappear from the galaxy. So I've just outlined two physics mechanisms for allowing black holes not to escape their own gravity, but to escape the gravitational potential well at the center of the galaxy. That can happen. And that may be part of the story, but my own thought is, and, uh, and you know, I've puzzled on this for a very long time as to why we aren't finding more of these things. My own thought is that there's something more subtle happening and it probably involves the interactions with the gas and the stars before you get to this point. But I don't know what it is. So uh, if you've got any good ideas, please let me know. <laughs> I seem to have lost audio. Uh, oh yeah, no, I'm no, you're on. Oh, okay. I'm back. Okay, apologize for that. Go ahead. I'm done. Thank you. That was okay. a wonderful. Answer. Thank you. Well, wonderful Thank question. You. Thank you. Thank Two you. <laughs> yeah, okay. um, we have another question here coming in from Philippe. You suggested that energy can be extracted from a black hole aside from Hawking's radiation. Is that correct? Um, yes. There's, there's, well, there's, I, I think there are two, three ways, if you like, I, I, that I described here. One is Hawking radiation is a purely quantum mechanical effect, and it only is significant or relevant for tiny, tiny black holes for whose existence we have as yet no evidence. So those are the tiny 10 to the 15 or so grams black holes as big as a mountain, massive as a mountain, say. Um, if we take the, the big black holes more than, say, a few times the mass of the sun, all the way up to 10 billion times the mass of the sun, if we take those big black holes, then the two channels for removal of energy are firstly to uh, throw gas or conceivably, or stars, if you like, uh, at them, so they orbit them, they lose gravitational energy, and that loss of gravitational energy, which can be up to um, up to 30% even of the rest mass energy, the e equals mc squared energy of the mass that you're giving to them, that uh, loss of energy uh, can, be can be released as radiant energy in a quasar, it'll be in the in the ultraviolet, in the um, in a, a binary, in a, in a stellar mass black hole with an accretion disk. It'll be more likely in the X rays, but it'll be released. So that makes what's one efficient mechanism. The second one for the big black holes, or classical black holes, is the rotational energy. And here, what you do is you imagine magnetic field lines that somewhat similar to the magnetic field lines that you depict. Uh, going through the surface of the Earth into the Earth's core. Um, those magnetic field lines can go through the surface of the black hole, the event horizon, and as actually happens also with the Earth, they can re extract rotational energy. They can only take energy out if the black hole is spinning, and the consequence will be that although the mass of the black hole will be lost, um, its, its spin energy will be lost even faster. And so eventually it will just slow down. So those are the two channels for removing energy from a classical black hole, gravitational energy and rotational energy. Fantastic, thank you. Um, I, had a, I had a question. Um, you had the animation of the tidal disruption event. I was kind of wondering what kind of time scale that was taking place. Is that is that a relatively quick thing or was that uh, animated quickly for for the benefit of the viewer. Um, yes, it, it was indeed. Uh, it would have exhausted the patience of even the most um, uh, a diligent astronomer. Um, the uh, basically, if we take a massive black hole in the nuclear scutcheon, typically it's the smaller mass black holes that do the the more tidal disruption. We're looking at 
a flyby time. This is the time scale on which the, the uh, star is ripped apart that might be measured in minutes to hours. It's, as I say, these are typically million to 10 million solar mass black holes that are doing this. However, if we take, um, we ask what happens to the gas then, the gas will be continue to be observed falling in for months to years. That's so, still that's still pretty quick though on an astronomical scale. That's oh that. yes, no, it's gone in. You know, but it, you know, it's like a supernova in some sense. You know, supernovae have those sort of time scales for a very very different reason. And basically, what you're seeing is the last rather faint emission that you're seeing is just a tiny amount of gas that almost has the escape velocity, but not quite. So it almost makes it to freedom, and then not quite enough, and it falls back in again. And then it provides fuel for the black hole and um, optical or, in some cases, X-ray emission. Very good. Thank you. Um, Philippe has a, a follow-up question. Uh, Philippe had asked earlier about distracting energy. And uh, he asks, but would the first example not be a loss of energy from the accretion disk rather than the black hole? So... Uh... Which sorry, sorry, which first example? Um, yes, I'm not. I'm not sure which she means. Oh, I, I mean gravitational energy. Yes, it um, it is. Um, but one way of one way of thinking about this, uh, it's a it's it's um, sometimes one can use the analogy of a bank. Um, you, you know, they'll make you a loan, um, but eventually it's got to be repaid. And so one way of doing the accountancy is to say that a, that a, a proton, let's say, let's say a single proton, has a certain amount of rest mass at large distances. Then we let it get very close to the black hole. That proton will give up some energy because it will have the same rest mass, but it will have a negative gravitational energy as well. It'll have some motional energy, and then it'll have the negative gravitational energy. That's a Newtonian way of thinking about it. And so the total energy will be less than the rest mass of the, of the proton. Then suppose that that proton subsequently is foolish enough to cross the event horizon of the black hole. It will do so with a total energy that is not its original rest mass energy, it's its rest mass energy um, plus its energy of motion, sometimes called kinetic energy, minus its gravitational energy, which is large. And so what it actually carries into the black hole is less than it had when it was a long way away from the black hole. So in that sense, by giving the, when the proton is accreted, by giving the black hole less, less energy uh, than it would have got had it got the full amount that the proton had at large distances, you are you know, it, it, it is powering the emission. So it's a little bit of an accountancy trick, if you like. <laughs> Such things happen in accountancy, I think. Yes. Um, I, I, had, I had one more question on my mind when you mentioned our, uh, I think you said in the Milky Way, a uh, the black hole at the center of our galaxy is, is a bit isolated and... Um, uh, I was wondering, if, if, do we have an inclination? Do we have an indication if that's a, if that's a common occurrence uh, for the center of the galaxy to have a lonely black hole? Oh well, no, well, it's a it's a single black hole. We, we we kind of know that because of the exquisite work that um, uh, Andrea Gez in Southern California and Reinhard Genzel in uh, in in in, in Gushing near Munich. Um, that they have done tracing the orbits of these stars. Let's suppose there were a black hole binary there or a cluster of stars around or something like that. Those orbits would be different. They would, they would be measurably different. And the fact that they're described by just following a black hole with indeed with relativistic corrections tells you that it really is a single black hole. And that's we that, as far as we can tell, is, is what's going on in most, most galaxies. So it is a single black hole. The thing that's um, 
uh, pity, pity, pitiable about it is that it's given so little fuel. It really, um, you wouldn't be able to see it at any distance from, from Earth. Uh, it's so starved of gas. And I'll repeat this again, that you should not, you should pity it, but not be ashamed of it, because you wouldn't want to live near an active galactic nucleus. That would have very bad consequences, I think. Uh -huh. Well, thank you. Um, we have a question coming in from Nelson on the chat. If a binary black hole was ejected from the center of a galaxy, what might happen to that galaxy having lost some of its central mass? And is there evidence for this of having happened? Uh, again, excellent question. And um, the answer is the, the masses of these black holes, even the monsters like in M87, are small. There's in a galaxy, say like M87, there's 10 to the 13 solar masses of dark matter, there's 10 to the 12 solar masses of stars, and there's a few billion um solar masses of, of say in that case six solar masses six billion solar masses of, of um of black hole so it's um less than one percent of the mass of the galaxy so it's you know it's not it's, it's certainly not very very much in mass and it's also it's tiny i mean it's, it's the size of the solar system um out to the Oort cloud or something like that so it's really is tiny and and yet it's able to um dictate terms to the surrounding cluster of galaxies to the gas in the surrounding cluster of galaxies and it's stopping it stopping itself from growing this this tiny th tiny machine in the center of the galaxy is stopping all that gas from falling in so um it, it it's uh uh a mighty a mighty engine but it's not much mass in terms of gravitational mass. So um, it will do a bit of damage if it, if it leaves, because what it will do is it'll, it, it, there might be a cluster, uh, a distribution of stars that's relaxed and very well behaved. And then we have um, this um, ejected black hole or black hole binary plowing through it. That will cause a disruption. So it will, it will shake, shake up things, but it won't be seen as much of a loss of mass. Hmm. Very good, very good. Uh, do we have any uh, other questions to come in? I think this will be the last call for questions. Otherwise, I'd like to thank you all for uh, coming. Oh, we do have Philippe coming in. Um, is there any scenario whereby a black hole's singularity loses energy and therefore mass through loss of rotational energy or emission of gravitational waves such as a, uh, a traveling black hole? You mean the singularity inside the horizon? Um, uh, the answer yes. to that is effectively, as far as classical physics, the, the physics of Albert Einstein, if you like, of general relativity, uh, the answer is essentially no. But as soon as we enter the Alice in Wonderland world of quantum mechanics, all bets are off. And then if we try and say what is space time like on the tiniest highest energy levels what is that like then all the sort of things that you were sort of alluding to or you know singularities coming and going um or uh, black holes forming and and evaporating and so on that's all going on wormholes all over the place all of that is almost certainly they manifest in a way that nobody understands right now. So things like that are going on at the quantum mechanical level. I think most of us suspect that's the case. It's just, you know, extraordinarily clever people have been unable to make, make you know, make, make a, a coherent description of this. But, you know, despite a lot, a lot of progress, but we're still a long way from understanding that in any detail. So at the quantum mechanical level, I think there's things like you alluded to can indeed happen, but at the level of what, what astronomers observe with their telescopes, that you know, black holes more than a few times the mass of the sun, um, then to all intents and purposes, cosmic censorship will work. Um, those singularities are not seen, 
what whatever dirty linen there is inside the black hole is will will never be part of our experience. If we were to consider an isolated black hole traveling through space, gravitational waves would be produced through the motion. Would would that not cause a loss of mass? Uh, not 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 really. Um, it, it, you know, it depends what, what you mean by moving through space. Um, if if it were just out in intergalactic space, moving in a straight line, then it doesn't it doesn't radiate. It's got it's got to. Um, uh, uh, I, I mean, basic, basically, the the rule is, um, you, you uh, if if you're dealing with sound, you've got to move if you if, to radiate. If you're dealing with electrons and electromagnetic radiation, you've got to accelerate. If you're dealing with gravitational radiation, you you essentially got to jerk. I'm being a little 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 bit oversimplifying here, but it basically means that you've got to have a a rapidly changing motion. Now that can be caused by moving in a in a gravitational um, gravitational field. So a star moving around, uh, say say let let let's say um, the Earth moving around the Sun radiates gravitational waves. There's no question that that happens. It's just it's tiny, 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 tiny. And if we were to replace the Earth by a black hole orbiting the Sun, and maybe there is a small black hole orbiting the Sun, it too would radiate gravitational waves in much the same way. With much the same, for a given mass black hole, it would radiate in much the same way. So there's really no difference in that in that sense. Um, and uh, but the actual amount of gravitational radiation that's being you know lost by um, by by planets in in the solar system or some similar system is tiny 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 and very much less than all the other things that are going on. Hmm. We have a question coming in from a different person now. Uh, you have Jenny again. What are the most exciting topics in black hole research that you're following right now? Oh gosh, uh, <laughs> there's no uh, there's. Um, Gosh, this may take all night. Um, okay, I'll try. <laughs> and, I, and I think if you asked any of us, you'd get a different answer. All right. Um, I, I'll, I'll give you a, a, per, a personal view. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to say um, I, 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 from the point of view of physics, astrophysics and astronomy i'll give you one answer for each uh for for physics i think what does albert einstein's general theory of relativity dis, uh describe what we observe in the case when we're dealing with merging black holes everything we have seen and some of these tests are as good as as Ten, one part in 10, 10 to the fifth, they're that good. Every, those have been mostly in weak field gravity. In strong field gravity, which is epitomized by merging black holes, we have much weaker evidence that general relativity is correct. We see nothing that's in contradiction with it, but it's just not very good. It would be lovely to um, have much more precise um, measurements of the gravitational wave signal to compare with simulations and to test, put GR relativity to the test and conceivably to the sword. Maybe there's some extra fields going on or some other craziness happening in the geometry. We've no evidence of that as yet, but is it, it's still a good science question. Is GR correct in that strong field limit? So that's my, that's my physics answer. I, I think my, um, Let's take my, my my astronomical answer is um, how are black holes born? I think that's the biggest one, and this is really tied up with the astronomy and the observing of distant uh, distant galaxies. You know, I like to say which came first, the galactic chicken or the black hole egg, and the answer is they both sort of came along together, just like in the just like in the developmental biology. But um, the understanding how they grew, do they, do, do they grow to a million solar masses 
uh, in one big collapse or do they grow up from 100 solar masses and so on? I see that as essentially something where it's not so much an, an issue of astrophysics, it's an issue of observe, astronomical observing. And I think we're going to see the answer to that. Again, I have a lot of faith pinned on, on James Webb Space Telescope to, for helping us unravel that question. And then I suppose my... Um, I, I, I'm not quite sure. I, I did, did have a sort of a, 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 a an ast astrophysics answer. Um, is how how in detail do the spinning black holes make these jets? How do they um, power the um, the uh, the emission that we see from active galactic nuclei and also from the stellar, the stellar counterparts. And um, I have a baverick view, heterodox or whatever you want to call it, or, or just plain crazy, um, that's different from the, you know, the wonderful people who've done the Event Horizon Telescope. And I personally think that what is going on there is that the spinning black hole um, is not only powering the jets, as I said, and now most people do do agree is the case, but instead is driving away essentially all of the gas that is supplied. So what is happening is that effectively it's all it's mostly nature, not nurture in that case. And so what happens is lots of gas is supplied at large radius, but it never gets it almost all of it gets nowhere near the black hole. It gets driven away by the power that's created by the spinning black hole, which isn't just going into the jets. It's actually driving away the gas. And that's a somewhat radical view, but it's the one that I hold on sort of with some observational uh, idea. And I think that's a question in astrophysics. So what is going on uh, when, in, in, a, in a source like M87 I think that's my number one astrophysics answer, but I've got numbers two, three, four, and five in each of those categories for you, but the, like, we haven't got time tonight to go through them. Splendid. Thank you. And we're getting words of thanks in the chat as well. Um, doctor, it's, it's been wonderful to... Uh, to listen to you and hear, and hear your presentation today. I want to thank you so much uh, for, for speaking. Um, thanks everyone for, for uh, attending. Um, we couldn't do this without you. Um, thank you to Linda and Linda, I presume you're still on. You want to, if you'd like to unmute yourself and, and say a word, you may. Um, thanks to our president um, of, the, uh, of the club. Uh, if anybody is interested in volunteering for the speaker committee, please reach out to the board of the San Francisco Amateur Astronomers. Um, and that's all I have on my mind. This is my last time hosting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. my, my last time saying um, thank you also. And um, I understand Gabe, Gabe Paulson, the vice mayor of Larkspur is going to talk to me about things that I can pass on happily over these years of research about what to do and how to find people and all sorts of things. So thank you. Thank you very much, Roger. I so appreciate you're here tonight. Well, thank you very much, Linda. And, <laughs> and uh Keep well, everybody. Keep well. Yes, indeed. Look after yourself. And I, I look forward to your um, meeting in person. Yes, I, I think that'll be wonderful. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Thank and you. As, as a reminder, we do not have a lecture in December. In December. So we hope to see you in the new year. Mm -hmm. Thanks, everyone. Happy holidays. <laughs>